Hello and welcome back. So here we're going to continue on um, kind of where we left off in the previous video where we went through how to perform uh, a single factor ANOVA analysis of variance. Um, and in that video, we also talked about how to perform the Fisher's LSD. So that was really covering off the completely randomized design. Uh, what, what we cover is the, the most basic uh, analysis of variance. The next two that we'll, we'll talk about them both in this video because again, you know, I'm focusing on the Microsoft Excel, you know, how to get the results that, that you need. And it really is um, quite simple and both of them are very, very similar to what we've already looked at in the completely randomized design. So these ANOVAs, there's two of these, okay? So the first one, in, in class, we talk about the next one, uh, the next sort of family of ANOVAs is the randomized block design. And the randomized block design is um, what we use when we have an, a, a set of experimental units, or it's could they call them blocks, and we get multiple data points from each of those experimental units. So if I have one, two, three, four, five experimental units or five blocks, let's say. And then I have, I don't know, four treatments or four samples. So I have A, B, C, D. So for each of those blocks, each of those experimental units, so experimental unit one, I have four data points. Experimental unit two, I have four data points. So this is comparable as you probably would have been ta uh, talked about in class. This is the multi-population equivalent to the matched sample design that you would have looked at when you were studying two population tests on means. There were the independent samples and then there was a matched sample in that segment of the course. Here now we're expanding that to multiple populations, just like the completely randomized design went from the two populations, which is just that two population t-test, expanded that to three or more populations. Well, that was the extension of the independent samples. Now this is the extension of the matched sample. Now, the way that I talk about this in class is a little bit different from uh, the tool in Excel. In Excel, it actually treats this as two factors. So I might have uh, a factor A and a factor B. My blocks might be a completely separate factor. In my class, I don't talk about testing for equality across the different blocks. In my class, I would talk only about testing for equality uh, across those treatments, across those uh, samples in factor A, or what Excel would be referring to as factor A here. So what I would have if this were my group is mu A, B, C, and D. And the alternative is the same uh, as a completely randomized, not all are equal. Now, when we do this in Excel, what you'll see is that in addition to testing for equality across these means, A, B, and C, Excel is also going to include a test across blocks. So as A equal to B, uh, sorry, one equal to two equal to three, four and five, so on. So Excel is going to have the results for two tests, the test in factor A and the test for factor B. So it will have a test corresponding to this type of layout, okay? So I'll walk through the Excel output as it, as it is presented, but word of caution, depending on how your instructor presents this material, it may come out a little bit different in class as opposed to what Excel produces. So let's just jump into our Excel sheet here. So this is what uh, that randomized block data might look like. So here I, I might call this, um, this could be my factor A. So I've in factor A here I have uh, four treatments, four samples. 
And then over here, if I insert another column over here, this, as far as Excel is concerned, is going to be treated as factor B. Now, again, in my class, I don't talk about this as being a two factor test. In my class, I would only be performing a test across these treatments in factor A, accounting for that source of variation that is introduced due to differences across factors, in, uh, sorry, across samples in factor B. But I don't test for differences. We'll look at that in a different context when we get to the factorial. So again, I'm just focusing on what Excel is going to, to produce, how to get the results out of Excel. We're not going to talk too, too much here about interpretation. If this discussion on having two factors and on blocks, on sources of variation, if that is causing you some confusion, I've got other videos in my statistics workbook. This would be module 13 of that statistics workbook on my YouTube channel that goes through an in-depth discussion about what all that means. This again is just looking at how to get the Excel output, okay? So familiar process, I come into data, data analysis here. Um, the previous video, we just went through how to get the results for a single factor ANOVA. Then we have the two factor with replication, two factor without replication. This, as far as Excel is concerned, is called the two factor without replication. Replication would mean that I have multiple observations for each treatment combination. Talk a little bit more about that when we get there. This one is gonna be a two factor without replication. In my class, when I talk about a randomized block design, this is the one that I would expect students to use. Okay, a familiar looking um, dialog box here. I've got values in here from the previous um, example. So once again, my input range, this one might be a little bit confusing. <clears throat> so as we've gone through the different exercises, I have always included my labels when I select my input range and Excel picks that up. Here, I have to keep in mind that I've got multiple labels, okay? And what I want are the labels for the treatments in both of these factors. So the way that Excel is gonna read this is that here I have one factor A and there's four treatments. So I want to include those labels as the labels for those treatments in factor A, okay? Now, I also have a second factor here. I have this factor B, and in that factor B, these would be considered the labels for factor B. I would have 27 treatments here in factor B. So when I select my input range, I need to select all of the labels for the treatments for the samples in factor A and all of the labels for the treatments or samples in factor B. So what this is gonna look like, I'm gonna start up here in this blank cell and I'm gonna highlight all of this. So that captures that first row that contained those labels for treatments in factor A that contains this first column that contains those labels for treatments in factor B. I'm not picking up these ones here. Excel won't know what to do with them. So I'm picking up just these treatment labels and these treatment labels here. Of course, I make sure I tick this box because I did select the labels. We've talked about this in other videos. My level of significance, whatever you think is reasonable, whatever your assignment is telling you to use, or 0.05 if you're not sure. My output range, okay. Now Excel's gonna give us a big chunk of tables. Look at all that. Because what it's giving us first is some summary statistics. Now, my students, I would just ask you, ignore all of this. Because my students and your assignments and your problems, you will have already given me a table of descriptive statistics. You will have already talked about those descriptive statistics. I don't want to see them again. But again, depending on your instructor, there might be different requirements, different expectations. So here you can see it's picked up those labels 1 through 27. That's these labels right here, 1 through 27. 
in each of those treatments, there's four observations. So that's what all of these fours are because there's four observations across each of those rows. Then it's giving me some average invariance of those four observations. I scroll down here. Now I see A, B, C, and D. So those are corresponding to these labels here, A, B, C, and D. Within each of those, there's 27 observations. There's my sum mean and variance of those 27 observations in each of those four treatments. Okay, now, maybe you don't need that, maybe you do. My students don't. Here's what I do need. Here's your ANOVA here. Now, this is where it's a little bit different from how it might be presented, at least in my classroom, as a randomized block. What we have here, some labels, rows, and columns. I generally would recommend to students to change those labels to make it a, maybe a little bit easier to um, follow along with the results to know what they're referring to. So here for rows, I don't have a context, I don't have a problem, um, a specific problem that I'm doing, but I would put in the name of the factor that correspond to the rows. So here I can see that has 26 degrees of freedom. That must be the factor that has 27 treatments in it. Here, this is factor B. Okay, now again, I wouldn't suggest that you put in factor B. I would suggest you put in what factor B is. What is the actual factor that you're working with in your problem? Columns, this is factor A. Three degrees of freedom, must have four treatments in it. That's our factor A, okay? Now, what Excel has given us here is two sets of results because it's doing two tests. It's testing for equality across treatments in factor A, and it's testing for equality across treatments in factor B. So it's doing these tests, both of these tests, my class, my students probably are only working with one factor, factor A, and I would not be asking you to perform the test on factor B. It's possible, but it's rare and it's unlikely. So when we look at these results, if I just, again, I always like to clean this up right away because it's easy to do. So I look, here's my factor A. So there's my results. Okay. Once again, you know, if you're transforming or if you're, you're, you're transporting these results into a Word document or into some report that you're writing, I would recommend taking that entire table because, again, it's common convention in an ANOVA analysis to include the complete ANOVA table, not just p-values and test statistics. Might be overkill, but that's common practice. So you would copy this table into your, your Word document, your report, and then here I have my p-value for factor A. My p-value is 0 0.02. If my level of significance is 5%, here I'm going to reject. I have evidence to show that there is a difference across treatments in factor A. Factor B doesn't look like there's anything there. I would not reject. That's a fairly high p-value. I would not reject. I have no reason to believe there's any significant difference in the average values of whatever my data is measuring. I don't know. I don't have a context here. But certainly, I'm not going to reject that, um, that test. So that's it. That gets us our results. Um, just like we talked about with the completely randomized design here, I've rejected that null hypothesis. So it makes perfect sense. You might want to go ahead and perform a Fisher's LSD. The Fisher's LSD is going to be formed in, in exactly the same way. I've got um, my degrees of freedom for that t distribution. I've got my mean squared error uh, for that calculation of, of the LSD. Everything about that LSD is going to be done the same as in the completely randomized or the single factor ANOVA that I talked about in the previous video. Okay, so you've got everything here to report those results. Now, while we're at it, while we're doing two factor tests, why don't we also look at how to perform a factorial or a two factor with replication? 
So a two-factor with replication means that I have multiple data points for each treatment combination. Now, if I look at this data set here, I can see that for treatment A, sorry, treatment A1, I only have one observation. Combination B1, I only have one observation, right? C1, I only have one observation. So for each combination of treatments, I have only one observation. And that's why when we came in here, we saw it's called without replication because those experimental conditions were not repeated. They were not replicated. If I'm doing a factorial, a two-factor with replication, it means that for each treatment combination, I have multiple observations. So what is that going to look like? Well, if I just, I'm just gonna tweak my data set uh, a little bit here. Okay, I just took a brief little time out there just to get my labels in properly. So here we have our revised data set. I'm using exactly the same data again because all I'm focusing on here is how to use Excel to get the results. I'm just kind of cheating on producing data sets so I can demonstrate how to use the tools. So I'm using the same data set as I did for the two-factor without replication or the randomized block design, this one that uh, we just talked about. Except now I've said, well, okay, instead of having 27, 27 different um, treatments, 27 different treatments with four observations in each, now I'm saying, well, in factor B, I have only one, two, three treatments. And here now I have those treatment conditions, those experimental conditions, repeated or replicated nine times. So for factor A and factor one, I have that, does that treatment combination, I have nine observations for that treatment combination, nine observations for B1, for C1, so on for 2A and, and 2B. So I have nine, what we call replications. So to deal with this in Excel, it's a familiar pattern. I'm gonna come in here, two factor now with replication. I'm gonna hit okay. I'm gonna select that input range. And once again, I'm selecting all of the labels just as we've done before. And now I'm going to say, okay, how many rows per sample? This is asking me how many replications. How many times has each treatment combination been repeated, been replicated? And here we know it's nine. I have nine observations for each treatment combination. Output range, where do we want it to go? I'm gonna put it over here so it doesn't overlap with what I have below. And okay. And we get another big output, but it looks distinctly different from that previous one. And this is because now Excel is testing three things just as you would have talked about in class when you are looking at a completely randomized design or the randomized block design we could see how the the, uh, the analysis was changing right this two factor without replication now i've got two tests i'm testing for difference across treatments in factor a and i'm testing for difference across treatments in factor b as you may know from your classroom classroom work with a factorial, not only am I testing across factor A, where I have treatments A, B, C, and D as my null, I'm also testing for equality across treatments in factor B, where there I had mu1, mu2, and mu3, in addition to those two, and now we're also testing for interaction. And there, that null hypothesis is simply that no interaction exists. This is testing for equality across all of those treatment combinations. So when we look at the summary statistics, well, that's what it's giving us. Here, if we look at the ends, it says total. I don't really like that name, total. 
But this is looking at, okay, in that first treatment here, I'm looking at factor B. This is one. This set of summary statistics here is giving us the summary statistics of all of those observations in treatment one of factor B. Let me just hide this other stuff. These, these summary statistics here, that's the summary statistics of factor, or sorry, treatment two. And here, summary statistics of treatment three. So these observations here. When we look down here, here I've got 27. This is looking at in factor, sorry, treatment A. Summary statistics across treatment A, B, C, and D. So these are all the treatment summary statistics. These are treatment summary statistics. What we have in the middle are the interaction summary statistics. So these are the summary statistics for treatment combination 1A. So here's 1A. I've got nine observations. Here's their sum, average variance. 1B, there's the summary statistics for 1B. 1C, summary statistics, and so on, through all of those treatment combinations. Then, when we come down here, here's that ANOVA. Notice again, let me clean it up, as I always like to do right away. Notice now I've got three test statistics, three p-values. We're doing three tests. Now to distinguish what test is what, it can be a little bit tedious. Excel uses labels, samples, and columns. Columns, well, those are columns. So those are my columns here. So that would be factor A. Again, I wouldn't suggest using the label factor A. If you're working on a problem, you know what factor A actually is. I would use whatever the name of that factor is. Sample, this is factor B. I know it's factor B because also here I can see it has two degrees of freedom, which means there must be three treatments in it. And so here that's got to be factor B. Again, don't put factor B, put the name of the factor. I don't have any context, so I'm just being general. And then there's our interaction. So there's our results for the factorial. Once again, common practice to include the complete ANOVA in your Word document or in your report. And then here I've got my p-values necessary in order to perform the test. So again, I'm gonna reject on my test for factor A, whatever the treatments are in factor A. I'm not rejecting for the treatments in factor B, and I'm not rejecting on interaction, okay? If you do reject, once again, we can perform a Fisher's LSD, just as we talked about in uh, the preceding video when we looked at the completely randomized design, the single factor ANOVA. In that video, we covered how to perform Fisher's LSD. Here, it's entirely the same. Okay, so I hope that that helps. That gets us through all of the analysis of variance work. Hopefully this will help get you through, get those results that you need for your analysis. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.